Sarah McCrum, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this brief conversation with me. Uh, you. You, yeah, you are a presenter in the Yin Center Conference that's coming up April 1st through 3rd, uh, 2022. And your presentation is titled Cultivating a Feminine Approach to Money. So my first question is, uh, is cultivating a feminine approach to money just for women or for people who identify with the feminine? Uh, I think it's very important for women because many women have found the masculine approach to money that's predominant on our planet at the moment extremely uncomfortable. It doesn't suit them very well. But what I'm seeing is that it doesn't suit men very well either anymore. It's kind of like a bit of a dying paradigm. And it's not that the feminine is going to take over. It's that we need to have a, a healthy balance between masculine and feminine. And at the moment, we have very often an unhealthy masculine, which is not actually good for anybody. And it's not good for our planet either. We know that. So it's for everybody, but it's really important for women. And so how would you, can you say a little bit about what is a masculine approach to money and what is a feminine approach to money? So the masculine part um, tends to be the more linear part. Um, I often see it that the feminine is kind of like the inclusive, soft, beautiful um, flow of money and the masculine part is the clarity and the direction and the specificness that happens with money and if you have all soft beautiful flow without any clarity it really doesn't work well and if you have all clarity and you're full of goals and intentions and things but you don't have any expansiveness you're not there's no receptivity in it there's mm -hmm. no sense of relating then that's missing something as well. So yes, it's look, I don't usually characterize it in terms of masculine and feminine, particularly. I think you you're actually much better at that than I am. But in terms of the experience, what I see is that our relationship with money has become it's it's very kind of linear mm -hmm. and limited as a result. And what I've experienced through a more feminine relationship with money is that money becomes much much more expansive. There's more of a sense of generosity in it, more receptivity, which solves a lot of the problems that people experience around money and takes out a lot of the stress. I love what you just said about it solving problems because it's so specific. And yeah, I'm realizing as you're talking, this is a different way for you to talk about your work and one of the things that I love so much about your work. So one thing I think of when we talk about expansiveness and flow and the feminine is that it can get really airy fairy. And for um, anybody, but certainly women who have had a really hard time in the linear approach to money, um, they want to go to this other extreme. But that's not what you're really talking about. It just doesn't work very well. You know, I've met so many people. They say to me, oh, Sarah, I can feel the money coming. But I'm kind of saying, well, where is it? And they say, well, I can feel it. So I know it's here. So they're in this kind of expansive, creative space, but they're not producing results. The alternative to that is you go into the goal driven, you know, I've got to push myself to get these results and they're not really experiencing life. They cut off themselves to get onto this linear track. We don't want to live like that mostly. And women definitely don't want to live like that. So how do we actually get results and feel good mm. and feel a kind of richness in our life, not just a richness in our bank account? To me, that's what gets really interesting and learning how to do that you will never do it on the extremes of the feminine or the extremes of the masculine. And you'll never do it limited. You actually need a really beautiful, healthy flow mm. between both of them. They activate each other. Mm. I love that. They activate each other. That's where the power is. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for that explanation. And I don't know if other people can feel it, but I can just feel the difference in my body when you're talking about it. And um, it's so grounding, you know, the sense I'm getting is 
when you when you move in from these two ex extremes, you're actually coming into the ground. You're coming in, you know, you're bringing it to the earth when you bring them together yes, in a dynamic way. Yeah, it, it yeah. makes it real. And what that means is results, mm -hmm. something that you can actually touch where you don't have to feel it's coming. It's actually arrived. You know, you can <laughs> do something with it. You can spend it, invest in your project or whatever it is you want to do. Yes. It's very, very different from imagining it. It sure is. You well, know that, David. I do. And I, <laughs> I'm a product of the program and it, it makes, and I have to say that through your work, one of the things that's most delightful for me is not, I mean, the big results are exciting, but the little results, the, the moment by moment materializations are so uh, thrilling. And it, 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 it's an instant feeling of connection to the system. Yeah. Um, so I would like to hear a little more about your journey with your own work. Um, you know, you've talked about the book that you wrote uh, has came through you and you needed to really catch up to it. And I just love to hear more about that process for yourself, how that's been. So to give a little bit of context, I found myself essentially writing messages from money. Mm -hmm. And it was like money was talking to me and it said, I'm an energy and I'm beautiful. It was very different from anything that I'd heard before. And it explained all about what money really is in a way that we don't usually understand it and how it connects us all together. And, and that it's a very, very beautiful, very generous energy that flows through our life. And I wrote that book at a time when I had no money. And at the end of writing the book, it took me about yeah. three months, I had no money. <laughs> So right, I can tell you that writing a book about money, even when money is speaking through your pen, doesn't solve your money problems. What I had to do um, was actually, I, I, I then was in a position where not only did I have no money, but I was starting in a new country. I moved to Australia with my husband. I didn't know a single person in Australia and had to pay all my bills. Mm. Um, and I had to pay rent every week. And I didn't want to get a job. I was living in an area where I couldn't get a job. And anyway, I, I think I'm totally unemployable. So I, I had two choices. I either just really struggle or I, I apply what's in the book and see if it works. Mm. And it was pretty much like that. It's like, well, I've got this book. Let's see if it works. And so I started to do the things that were in it. And a lot of it's about asking for what you want and relaxing so that you can receive it. And so from time to time, I would literally have to ask for the rent because I didn't know where the rent was going to come from because I didn't have many clients. And then the money would come and it sounds crazy, but it it did. And we got through the first couple of years really on that. That was my training ground of the book. And then gradually we, we started to get financially a bit stronger. I wasn't worried about the rent anymore. But then, you know, there would still be bigger bills and things that I would need to do the same thing and so I got better at that and then at one point I had a really big like something happened over in, in about 10 days 4,000 people signed up for a course that I was offering and it was extraordinary and suddenly I had money pouring into my bank account every day for about six months and then that ended suddenly overnight the person I was working with pulled out I to this day I don't know why we were kind of like really good friends Wow. And she it, she disappeared and that stopped. And then I had to go back and say, OK, like I had about a day to really figure it out and get myself doing solving the problem, because I knew that although I had a lot of money, I put that aside because I wanted to buy a place to live. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't going to touch it. I needed to have money coming in. So it's a, it was for me, it's been a very real process of growing with the ups and downs of growing. But there has been progress from literally really very rarely having more than twenty dollars in my bank account at the beginning mm -hmm. to coming to a place where now we bought a farm last year. And I know that I have, I don't have massive security yet because I put a lot into the farm, but I have something. I'm not on the edge like I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I can see the next level coming. Mm. So it's always been like that for me. There's a period of contraction and then there's expansion. During the contraction, I learn the habits of the next level, if you like. I learn to relate to money at a 
bigger level. And once I'm there, the bigger level is there and it happens. But then there's another level going to come. So I start to feel a bit small compared mm. to the next level. Mm -hmm. So I feel contracted. I'm not really, I'm just growing. It's like growing pains in a way. That's really the essence of my story. Mm. Um, and the, the, I think the amazing thing about it is that we were all always all right. I've always felt this sense since I had the book and I see this in other people, there was a, a feeling of protection that even though we were on the edge, we were always okay. We always paid the rent. We always managed everything. Mm. And, and the other thing is that even when, when I was starting from such a difficult place, it was always a good story if you see what I mean. So the although there've been contractions along the way and you know, losing that business partner was hard in a way, but somehow it was the perfect thing to happen because it got me to do what I really needed to be doing, which was producing my own course, which is the course that you know, you've done. Um, it got me to do some really amazing things that I wouldn't have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so it always turned out really beautifully, even if at the time, sometimes it feels uncomfortable. Yeah, I was wondering what your reflection back was, or at the time, with that extreme. Uh, and I love what you said about, you know, what you're saying about um, being the contraction preparing you for the next growth. And sometimes it can be pretty radical. And yes. Yeah. And a lot of times we put that into a feeling of vic we make it about being a victim or something or being rejected by the universe even or well, um, we just feel small. I failure. think you feel small because you've got this grand idea. Maybe you've actually some something you, you feel inspired by something. You feel very small in relation to it and incapable mm. in many ways. And then you can make yourself a victim like I'm not good enough yet. Yeah, in a way that's true yes i'm really not enough to do this thing that i'm inspired by but i'm going to do it anyway and that's when the help starts to show up if you say oh i, I i'm too small i can't do this i'm not going to do it then you never get to have that experience so yes absolutely we're not good enough but that was never an excuse not to do it it's perhaps the reason for doing it and and then you get better well and to turn that statement around into a real uh honest question Am I not good enough? And what do I need to, what's, what are the next steps? How do I? Yes, how do I get better? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to also touch back to, you mentioned the asking and then the relaxing, which are of course these essential elements of your work. And those are so yin to open to the vulnerability of asking and to really connect with what you really want you know, I can feel how when we, to connect with what I really want, there's a risk there because if I really turn to what I want, I may not get it or I may get it. That's just as much of a risk too. Yes. So I saw somebody yesterday who connected with what he really wanted and it literally felt like, oh my goodness, if I really got that, it's almost like I'm not ready yeah. for what I really, really want. So we protect ourselves. We don't want to fail and lose but sometimes it's like I don't really want to live fully either mm. but of course we're longing for that mm. so the, the, there are some interesting dynamics that come up along the way as you learn about this longing it's so all those tensions you're describing are so interesting they're so the stuff of life and and wanting to express in the world and, then yeah, and I think that's very much what money's really mm. about. If you think mm. about it, you know, we want money because we want things and experiences. And often we shut those down because we're not supposed to want money, but it's natural to want experiences. That's, that's what we're here for. So we're shutting down the very natural desires that, that fuel our life. And then of course we have a complicated relationship with money. So in many ways, I think my work and the book especially help to reverse that and say, it's all right to mm. want to have a rich life it's all right it's all right to want to experience things here and it's all right to want to have the resources to be able to do that and that's not going to turn you into a destructive nasty person it's actually going to turn you into a person who wants to add more beauty to the world and to be, be a benefit to the world because that's actually what happens when you stop stifling yourself and allow your natural creativity and the natural gift of who you are to come out 
Yay. It's so liberating. Yes. That's the beauty of it. We look for freedom through money. And mm. most, most people don't find it. But when you really find money, the essence of money, you find freedom at the same time. Mm. It's amazing. Mm. Mm. Oh my goodness, I think that's a good pausing place because people are going to jump at wanting to hear more. Um, did we say the name of your book? Do you want to tell? Oh, yeah, the book is called Love Money, Money Loves You. Thank you. Great. And the session you'll be leading is Cultivating a Feminine Approach to Money at the Yin Center Conference, April 1st through 3rd. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, David. <laughs>